This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. Okay, so now we have Mike Farrar. Mike is, he's very active on the Facebook group and on Reddit. He's got always have a great theory. He's has so many great theories. I love it. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing pretty good, James. Were you ready to play our game? I'm ready to play. First encounter with a wolf story. I'm, I'm actually fairly new to wolf. Um, I looked through my Amazon orders and it was um, December of 2014. Um, I had ordered Lexicon Earthis and Solar Labyrinth by Robert Borsky. And so I think from that, that it was the summer of 2014 um, where I first encountered Wolf. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to go with um, the first book. I don't have Severian's memory, so I think first encounter was the best of Gene Wolf, and the first story was most likely The Island of Dr. Death and other stories. And uh, it it blew me away. I mean, I the road to get there, I read, you know, a lot of classic science fiction, Foundation, and... Uh, Philip K. Dick, Le Guin, Octavia Butler, Neil Stevenson, like, but nothing has really affected me like Wolf. And I think it's kind of like, I think they always say this on, uh, on Reddit and Facebook, it kind of ruins you. I mean, it's hard, to, <laughs> it's hard to go back to reading other science fiction after you encounter them. Yeah, I, I very much agree. And uh, Island of Dr. Death. I remember Jack Dan talking about that story and saying how sometimes you read a, a story and it just changes you. Favorite novel or short story, either or both. Yeah, and I guess it would be cheating to say the series, the entire solar cycle. So if I had to <laughs> narrow it down from there to just one novel, I'll, I'll say The Shadow of the Torturer mm. because, I mean, it was... It was love at first sight. I mean, I don't know why that world and those characters were so appealing because it's there's so much like darkness. There's so much horrific stuff. But the way Gene Wolfe writes it, it's like you just you just don't look away. But you're also not you're not overly, I guess, freaked out. Like I read. The Road by Cormac McCarthy, and I'll never pick up that book again. I mean, it was a wonderful book, but it just was so heavy and so dark. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. whereas Wolf, I mean, like, I read it for for fun, and and none of it is is light, and yet it's just so wonderful. All of all the conversations and all the people you meet and all the places you go, it's just it's hard to describe, but total tangent. But yeah, I read the road in one sitting one night. I remember I started reading it and I was like, I have to finish this now or I know I'll never come back to this. Cause it's just awful. Yeah. But <laughs> I totally get it. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. And I read it. I think my, my third child, my son, James was like nine months old. And so I kept going in and like, you know, is he alive? Is he okay? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was really, it was a really a, a bad time reading that book. But yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Like I said with Wolf, it's it should be similar, but it's it's just not. You yeah, just you keep going back. Um, well, I guess to shift uh, to short story, I guess the one I think about the most, and it's not my favorite, but is uh, Hour of Trust. I think about all the time, and I don't know if it's the this moment history, and I try to think about like how Gene Wolf was seeing. I guess the moment in history when he wrote it and seeing all those, uh, the radicalism of the, you know, early to mid seventies with all the bombings and these, these groups that had started with such high intentions, just resorting to violence and, and kind of mayhem. And, but our of trust, just it, <laughs> the, the hippies or whatever they're supposed to be, they just seem so clownish. And then the, the response by some of the the military personnel and it just it's such a weird story that I never stop thinking about that one and like I said it's not by any means a favorite or I guess yeah <laughs> it's not my favorite but it's one I think about more than a lot of his other short stories and I don't know why okay uh favorite wolf word uh, there yeah there's so many but uh, <laughs> again another one that 
it's got a dark connotation, but it's so fun sounding. Oubliette mm-hmm. is, is such a great word. But a place you send someone just to forget about them. And that's <laughs> that I you know what that's and that came up in the movie Labyrinth, which I think is probably the first place I heard that word. It's just cool to me. Yeah. Not a place you'd want to visit. But... Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really good word. Although, you know, I was just thinking that the antechamber in the House Absolute is more of an oubliette than Severian's oubliette is. They, nobody really checks in on anybody who's being sent to the antechamber. But the, you, know, they, you do at least eventually get told you're going to be executed if you're at the oubliette. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. You're right. That's a good point. I'm glad you said oubliette. I think that's, is that the first person who said oubliette? But that's, that's a that's one of my personal favorites too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another one I've done was Natural. I love. I mean, I just uh, yeah, these heat seeking death machines, and yet it's such a fun word to say. So I guess those two. <laughs> a personal non consensus theory about a wolf story, or your favorite one? Yeah, it's it's mine, and it's the one that I can't make work for the life of me, but. Um, I always think of, I think in uh, Solar Lab and Borsky said that sometimes he felt like he understood everything and then he, other times he felt like it was just all whizzing by him and above his head. And so what I'm trying, I guess, to figure out is I, I think the world, the world becomes Yassad. I just, you know, all the pieces are there for me. Um, and at the ending of Short Sun with Silk, and marble and C rack and, and nettle and they go back and, and mainframe is well we think maybe healed and mainframe is you know kind of one mind and one voice now not a bunch of you know psychotic you know digitized ghosts fighting each other and I just I want to know what happens next and so I guess my fan fiction I'm writing is just that somehow some way the world leaves Briar ends up in another universe and it just gets turned inside out and upside down and it ends up this, you know, this, the world of Yassad, which like when you, when you go to Yassad and it's so beautiful on the surface and, and perfect. And yet underneath the surface, you have these beetles and people just whizzing around in this kind of like clockwork. They're, they're down there in the, uh, metropolis style underworld and they're they're toiling away and they don't get to the surface and it's like this hell and um and not heaven and so it always makes me think of the world and you know the world's dark underbelly there where all the you know the tunnels where the water's moving around and there's all the underground structures for the uh the governments and stuff like that. And I don't, I, like I said, I can't make it work exactly why it is the way it, you know, why it becomes Yassad. But I think with the personalities that are going there at the end of the short sun books, it just feels like it should be true to me. And like, it'd take me years of rereading. Maybe I can make sense of it. Maybe not. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, that's an awesome theory. I like that. Absolutely. And I had never really made that connection with, yeah, when Afeta shows him the underworld of Yassad and how there's kind of two layers in the world too. I'd never really put that in that direction. That's good. Yeah, That's really like, good. That's good. And you said fan fiction? Is that, it, you're writing fan fiction? <laughs> That's what I feel like I'm doing. With the theory. Oh, okay. I was about to say, I was like, <laughs> I haven't read this, but the, now I'm even more fascinated. I'm like, I want to read this. Well, no, the things that always fascinate me are like, what happens the next page after everything ends? Like, cause I, I want to know what happens to Silk and Marble and, you know, and I want to know what Mucor does on her island after everyone leaves. And, and I just like, so that's the things I think about all the time, just because where a wolf leaves everybody, you know, Severian's on Ushas and, you know, uh, he's the sleeper god. He's calling himself what, Onus or whatever. And I'm like, okay, what's next? You know, like, where's he going? What's he going to do? Is he going to go back to sleep? I mean, is he mortal at that point or a god? I'm thinking he's a god because he's the new sun. And as long as the new sun shines, he's, you know, he's got his powers. I, I don't know, but... Yeah, like all this stuff just really consumes more of my uh, thoughts than it should. (laughs) (laughs) 
All right. Most frustrating mystery in a wolf story. Yeah, I, I kind of, I guess I kind of answered it um, at the end of the last question. All of them, it, all of it drives me crazy. Like I want to know, you know, what's on Loon during the new sun. Um, I want to know why Selenia's buried in Severian's mausoleum, you know, at the end of short sun. I want to know who the heck, you know, that guy is that Silk meets in the Madison Tower uh, with, uh, you know, young Severian. It, it's not our Severian. He's this kind of more happy-go-lucky dude. You know, you want to see my... Yeah, he meets Marin much earlier. He has a dog much earlier. He seems happy, he's happy you know, and he, and he... And that's the impression. Like I'm like, he seems more like um, like Yamar, like Retchi from, from uh, Earth and the New Sun than, than the Severian that we are with you know, the first third of Shadow of the Torture. He seemed like... Well, maybe, you know, maybe he never thought he was happy and everyone else looked at him as just some happy-go-lucky Severian. (laughs) Yeah, this happy, kind of carefree kid who's learning how to, you know, torture people and (laughs) do horrible things. Well, who would... What kid wouldn't love that? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, some some would probably. (laughs) My kids seem like that sometimes, but... All right, well, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. No, thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. It was an honor and a privilege, guys. That was really, really enjoyable. This was sponsored entirely by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash rereadingwolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out by email or by one of the other methods listed in the show notes to this episode.